So uh, we're going to just start off just simply by saying, introducing yourself, like who you are, what your position is, and uh, what school you hold that position at, and how long you have been doing uh, this particular ac uh, athletic director's position at Mission Vista or any other school. Okay. Yeah, so uh, my name is James Hall, and uh, currently I teach uh, AP U.S. History, um, head uh, girls soccer coach and athletic director at Mission Vista High School in uh, Oceanside, California. Um, I became uh, athletic director in uh, 2014. Um, Mission Vista before that did not have an athletic director position. Um, the school was, uh, when it was kind of conceived, created, um, the original plan was for the school to not have athletics. Um, it's a magnet school and the, the original thought was that the athletic programs at the high schools in the district would just stay at Vista and uh, Rancho Buena Vista. And um, from my understanding, because I was still in, in Denver at the time, um, that they added it at the last minute. So it was really underfunded and no athletic director position. Okay. So, so you know, I, I sent you a list of questions, basically where we're going to try to go at with the, the whole uh, athletic department, because it, the school that I go to is, uh, is Concordia University. Uh, it's a, a Christian school and uh, athletics there, same. It, it built up, I guess, over time. Uh, they were designed at first just to be a Christian education school, right? And so then they built up their athletic department. But some of the questions we uh, was sent to you was, is like, do you have a hiring and firing uh, procedures and processes in place? If so, what does that look like and how difficult is it to execute? Okay, yeah, we, we do. Um, so for most positions, um, there's really two ways. Like if we know somebody who's interested and qualified, um, like for a varsity head coach position, we will, um, we can bring them in and interview them um, and, and not have to go through uh, the district process. If it's a position where we don't have somebody that we know of, we will open the job up through the district and they'll post the job on EdJoint. Okay. So we're actually doing that right now for our athletic trainer position. So our, um, our previous athletic trainer um, took another job. So that was open. So we, um, we didn't have anybody in mind. So we opened that up through the district. We put a, uh, a requisition into the district and then they post the job on EdJoin. Now, once we get applications, um, they, will go through, they will go to the district and the district will forward them to our site. And then the hiring uh, process is um, we'll call them in for interviews. And the interview team is if it's a head coach position, it'll usually be me and uh, my assistant principal that oversees athletics. So usually the two of us. Once in a while, it'll be um, we'll add the principal as well. So it'll be the three of us. If it's a, um, a, an assistant position or a J, JV position, since we don't have freshmen, um, we, will, uh, we will have the coach, if they have somebody in mind, give us that name and we'll bring them in for um, sort of an informal interview um, because I want head coaches to have uh, the people in place that they want, that they're comfortable with, that they know have the same values as them. So if they have somebody in mind, um, as long as that person um, meets kind of our, um, you know, qualifications, understanding what we do at Mission Vista, you know, uh, education-based um, athletics, et cetera. And then we just do the background checks. So we also, um, head coach positions or stipend positions. So if you're a varsity head coach or a JV head coach, we have a little more stringent um, requirements at the district level where they have to get fingerprinted and drug tested. We have started doing that with all of our assistants, um, even if they're volunteer assistants, because we don't want anybody falling through the cracks. Usually, usually with a volunteer position, they would just have to um, fill out some paperwork, um, but people can fall through the cracks. 
Uh, so we send, um, we send them also for their uh, fingerprinting and, and drug testing. Okay. So, so when you looking at your coaches, what is the, the biggest values that you are looking at from your coach, especially when you talk, uh, I know you have uh, teachers and compassion to walk on coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the values that you are looking for out of your walk on coaches? Yeah, walk on coaches, that's always the, uh, if you talk to other athletic directors, that's um, generally the most difficult um, kind of value principle that you're looking for from them is the education-based athletics and, and not to be win at all costs. Okay? Okay. Um, you know, if they, if they have just come from, say, a club situation or competitive situation, sometimes they'll have that mentality. Um, you know, myself, when I first started, um, you know, over 20 years ago, um, I've kind of, I've definitely grown in that area myself as well. You know, when you first start out and, and you want to win, you're super competitive, you know, sometimes you have that mentality too. Uh, so it's, it's important to, um, to educate them on that, especially if they're young coaches. Um, the other things, the other things with that is we want, um, we, I mean, we want to win just as much as anybody else, but we want our kids to also enjoy what they're doing. Um, so that, that's important. We want them to understand that at the varsity level, yes, we have more of an emphasis on winning. Okay. But if we are say winning a soccer match or basketball game and, and we're up by a lot, can we get other kids in? Can we get them playing time? Um, at the JV level, a uh, little less emphasis on winning and more uh, skill development, right? Um, tactical development, things like that. So can we grow our players and get them to the varsity level? Gotcha. Um, yeah, so those are, those are the uh, kind of the big, the two big ideas, right? The education-based athletics and then the, the kids enjoying it and, and, and being tied to school. Okay. All right. So uh, next question I had was, uh, what is your steps for in or in state and for organizing and running staff meetings, right? So uh, is it an open Q and A when you do staff meeting with your coaches or is a directive style, like one way you talking, they listen. Um, yeah, it, de it depends what the purpose is um, with everybody's busy schedule and us having off campus, um, you know, a bunch of off campus coaches. We try to have um, as little meetings as possible, right? We don't have them just to have a meeting. So there's a purpose behind them. Almost, almost always it's uh, to get information to them. Um, so we will, uh, um, I'll have an agenda and we will go through that step by step. We do always leave it open for questions at the end, um, but that's kind of the, the structure um, you know, with, with our meetings is it's going to be uh, the things we absolutely need to cover. And we're going to try to stick to our starting time and our ending time with everybody's uh, busy schedules. You know, anytime you're trying to schedule a meeting um, during the school year, you're going to have some coaches who are in season, right? So when are you going to have your meeting? Is it going to be early in the morning? Then you might have a problem with your off-campus coaches, being able to get there. If you do it right after school, then you're probably going to have a problem with your coaches who are in season getting there, right? They might have a game or, or practice. So um, we do try to uh, stick to our, um, stick to our agenda. We try to stick to our time period. And as much as I can, if it's, especially if it's just information based, like especially right now with COVID um, and things changing all the time, I, uh, I try to do as much as I can through um, email too. All right. So, go ahead. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Oh, so I was going to ask, uh, the follow-on would be, do you ever schedule uh, into your meetings where if coaches missed it, do you have like a, let's like a makeup meeting time? Do they? Uh, yeah. Yeah. We, I'll usually talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Good to go. All yeah. right. So other places we're going to move into is like budgeting. All right. The budgeting thing is, it's like a big driving force, I, I'll say, behind most uh, athletic programs. And uh, so when we talk about budgeting, what is your number one focus when you are thinking about preparing your budget? Okay, so uh, my budget, 
is really small <laughs> compared to uh, uh, like some of the other comprehensive high schools because we don't have football. Okay. So um, most uh, most of the other schools, their budget is going to come from their revenue from uh, football and then boys basketball. Um, so basically what I usually get is from my principal and it might be only say $1,500 a year. Okay. For, um, that I get as athletic director. Now, what we will use that for, uh, kind of the two big things I have to use that for is, uh, buying our, um, supplies for our athletic trainer for the training room. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, with, um, the other thing is the uh, banners that we hang in the gym, right? For league championships, CIF championships. So that generally will come out of uh, whatever I have left over um, minus the athletic training room supplies. So those, for me, those are kind of the two big things. Um, our, uh, we're in the process right now of trying to get uh, more money from the district um, for each of the three athletic programs in our district. So that may change. Um, my principal just gave me a, uh, gave me a call the other day saying, Hey, we may have, we might get like 40 to $50,000 from the district. And so now we're looking at, he wants me to look at what are, uh, what would be priorities be to use that money to kind of help all of our athletic programs as much as possible. So it might be say a batting cage that baseball and softball can use. Uh, it might be um, new nets for the four to six goals that we have for boys and girls soccer, right? Are there things that we need in the gym um, to help the gym sports, volleyball, basketball? Okay. Um, all of our uh, individual sports, um, you know, when you look at budget, uh, it's important for us to have those coaches understand how our um, system runs. We have our ASB. And then we have our foundation, which is, I saw a question like on boosters. We don't have individual boosters for every program. They all go through our foundation. So it's important for them to understand how those systems work and to always monitor so that they're in the black and not the red. Got you. All right. And so which leads me into my next question that you hit on. Uh, consider taking football, you know, and football being a big driving force in most uh, CIF schools. Uh, yeah. What is your position on football? Like, what do you feel? Do you feel it is as a positive or a negative to have a football team at a high school? Overall, I think it's a, I think it's a positive. Um, one is you're, you're going to have more kids involved, right. In a sport at school. Um, I, you know, I've always been at schools that had football and, uh, um, you know, I th think football is a, uh, a great uh, builder of school spirit, school, school involvement, right? Kids going to football games on, on Friday nights. Um, I know kids at our school, there are kids that wish that we had it. Um, you know, with us, unfortunately, there's no plans for us to ever add it. We don't have a facility on campus um, and kind of the district um, idea is that they'll just leave it at Vista and RBV and Mission Vista won't, won't ever have it. So, um, yeah, I wish, I wish we did, um, you know, as, uh, not worried about the money that it generates, but just that the, uh, you know, the, the spirit and, um, what it brings on Friday nights is, I think is, a, is a positive for schools. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah that's good. All right. So, you know, it, it, we would generally go on and ask more football questions, but <laughs> y'all don't have that team. So we I know. skip over that section and go into the uh, next uh, section, which you did hit on, was about administrative, uh, when you talk about fundraising, all right? So fundraising, administrative fundraising, how, what is your processes for when teams, like you meant, I think you mentioned that y'all don't have a freshman level program it's only uh, varsity and jv yeah okay. yeah we, we have varsity and jv um generally what we do is <clears throat> if a uh if a um program is going to use a new fundraising format or system i have them run it by me just to make sure that it's legitimate 
Um, and we had a situation uh, a few years ago where girls basketball was doing something and it was kind of them getting, it was tied to them getting their uniforms and um, equipment, warm ups, things like that. And uh, they were supposed to get, um, you know, kind of a good deal on the stuff and uh, some other things provided. And so they went through this whole process and then the orders never came and never came. And we called and we called. And what happened was the, um, you know, it was a scam. Basically the company shut down and they took the money and the program never got their stuff. So we try to vet that stuff as much as possible, make sure that it's legitimate. Fortunately, that's the only time that's, that's happened to one of our programs. Usually we're using, um, well-known, well-respected fundraising platforms, like let's say SnapRaise. Okay. Um, that's generally our, our, our biggest platform that our programs use is SnapRaise. But any other, any other programs, we'll vet it. We'll make sure that it's legitimate. And uh, the, the individual programs run those things themselves. So, uh, okay, in comparison to some of the schools, uh, just knowing, for like Fallbrook, uh, do you make it a requirement for your fundraisers to be siphoned or funneled or through your ASB or do you even have an ASB program? Yeah, we do. So uh, coaches, uh, the programs have an option. <clears throat> if it's the kids, generally here's the, here's the rule. If the kids are doing, and the language is a little vague, if the kids are doing the majority of the selling right, of whatever they're doing, of the fundraising, then that money is supposed to go to the team's ASB account. Okay. If it's not the kids doing the majority, and that's kind of where the, the um, caveat is in the language, right, what's majority, <laughs> um, then they can use their, uh, fun, their uh, foundation account. Okay. And the benefits of the foundation account is uh, it's quicker. Paperwork is easier. Um, you know, they don't have to go through it. Uh, they don't have to put their um, budget into an ASB meeting and um, kind of justifying what they're buying. And then it, it's in the ASB meeting and they have to approve the minutes, right, of, their, of the meeting and all these processes. Foundation, uh, the coach has, um, the coach is the authorized um, overseer of the account. And then they have a, um, a parent who is kind of a secondary set of eyes over the account. And then it always goes to me to sign as well. So I can, we kind of have two people overlooking it. Gotcha. Um, so that coaches pr generally prefer um, the foundation account, you know, as, as head coach of girls soccer, I use my foundation account um, probably 99% of the time, just because it's, it's much faster and much more efficient. Okay. All right. So the next question would be is, uh, do you have a cap, like a cap amount? What is the ceiling that these uh, fundraisers can raise? Oh, no, we don't. Um, we, I mean, <laughs> we want them to raise as much money as they can, you know, uh, especially because, um, especially because we don't have a big budget coming from me. Right. So the programs are, it's important that they raise enough to cover their, their uniforms, their equipment and tournaments they want to get into awards for the end of the year, pretty much everything that they need, they have to raise um, for themselves. So with soccer, we have to, um, we don't have, and I saw something on the field too, of our facilities, um, this kind of plays into that, but with uh, soccer, we don't have um, a suitable facility really on campus for varsity matches. We have, we have uh, on our upper field, we have two soccer fields, and then we have a lower um, varsity field behind our gym, but the surface isn't good enough. It's not lighted. Um, so <clears throat> our soccer programs, boys and girls soccer programs, usually – we'll have to rent like the Vista sports park Oh, okay. or yeah. Or um, sometimes we can, we can get on and play at Vista RBV and generally we don't have to pay there, but sometimes we have to take into account that we may have to pay 
uh, for some field rentals too. So every program is kind of um, has different needs. Mm -hmm. They all have to understand that they need to raise, um, you know, kind of the minimum level that they need to, to take care of their program. All right. So taking me into this question is, uh, so you said that sometimes you use RBV. So with uh, sports in your school and the surrounding schools, so I think you have around you, it's uh, Vista, uh, El Camino, and yeah. Fallbrook, and now Bonzo, which I really don't know much about their setup. Yeah. But there's never an agreement that the ADs or the principals are willing to make to co-share a field with your school. We, um, you know, because it's, it's more tied to your district. So, you know, I can get more, uh, I can get more help from Vista and RBV because they're in our district and I have those close relationships with their ADs too. And then if we need to, we can go through, through the district, right? Mm -hmm. um, just makes it easier. I've had conversations before with uh, schools outside of our district, um, like Oceanside. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really because they're, you know, I have a good relationship with their soccer coaches. So I've talked to them before about, hey, if I'm in a pinch with either our boys or girls soccer team and we can't find and the Vista sports park is uh is booked up and we can't use Vista RBV because they have something going on um can we come over there um they have said yes before and we haven't had to use it yeah gotcha. uh but yeah and sometimes what we'll do is with with uh especially with those coaches that I have a really good relationship with is let's say um let's say we're supposed to host girls varsity soccer and JV girls soccer on our campus. And then our boys are away at say Oceanside. We may do um, a triple header over at Oceanside and play, let's say the boys JV and then boys varsity and then girls varsity there. And then keep our JV girls at Mission Vista. Okay. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll do things like that um, with, with, with soccer. Gotcha. All right. So, all right. Uh, going back to, to boosters, because, you know, we, we have a host of questions with always with boosters. Yeah. What is your requirement on your booster club? What does that look like for you? Yeah. Well, like, like I said, we, um, we kind of have it all centralized and all housed under our foundation. Our administration does not allow separate booster accounts except for the foundation account. Okay. And part of the reasoning behind that is um, is things that have gone on with booster accounts, right? And not having uh, real good oversight of what's happening with the money. Okay. Um, we want to try to keep, uh, you know, sometimes with boosters, the parents who are in charge, kind of in charge of the booster account, right? Think that they're running the program and you know try to tell the coach what to do with the money or try to have influence over their kids playing time or things like that or the level that they're on so we try to keep it uh, we do keep it housed right in that foundation and all of our programs know that they can't have a separate booster account okay. in addition to the foundation yeah all right and that, well and i think you answered the second part it was about coaches and staff involvement and i, and I believe you say your coaches are the leads and a parent is yeah. the assistant. Yeah, so yeah, we have that kind of oversight of the money where the, uh, so if I, if I want to, um, let's say I'm putting the, there's two ways I can do it. I can put in ahead of time to get money from the foundation because I'm going to place an order and then I want to pay. Or if it's, if it's a smaller um, amount, maybe I bought, $200 worth of say soccer balls, I can get reimbursed from my account. Um, but I have to provide receipts and um, both, both ways of doing it. You have to submit uh, paperwork um, about what you're buying and the justification for it. And then not only do, and then your, uh, your second signer has to sign it. So it's the coach and then that kind of parent um, oversight. And then it'll come to me 
and then I'll submit it. And then our foundation has all their, um, they have their board of directors and they have their president, but uh, generally that stuff goes to the treasurer and they'll look it over as well. And then what happens is if, if they, um, you know, if they have any questions on that, they'll, they'll ask me. Okay. So what leads me into when we talk about, you know, fundraising and big thing with athletics in, in every, in every level, NCAA, whatever the level, yeah. Uh, we always find like what involvement or say so do your students have in how that money is used? Okay, so uh, yeah, with with the ASB account, they are supposed to have a team meeting um, and um, discuss that, and then they have to vote on it. And so that paperwork, if they're buying stuff through their ASB account. Um, that stuff is all part of the paperwork and the approval. Yeah. With the foundation, you don't um, have that. Um, we don't have the requirement of having meetings and minutes that the, um, that the kids approved it. Okay. So that's, <laughs> that's probably why some coaches like that, right. <laughs> they can kind of make the decision, but um, that also comes in with the parent signer and then me like looking it over and saying, well, is this really a good use of the funds that you have and, and do you need it? Now we've never not, we've never denied somebody, um, you know, because coaches do a pretty good job of knowing what they need and they understand that their budget's limited. So where am I going to get the most bang for my buck? What's going to be most efficient for us? All right. All right. Okay. We're, we're going to be coming down here to like three more sections. Okay. All right. Facilities. Uh, and, and again, you know, you don't have that normal facility requirement of that football field, yep. which is a big thing. Um, what is the driving force behind your, your facility maintenance? What okay, yeah, so we, we uh, there's several things. One is, um, you know, you, like, like you said, we don't have a lot of conflict for our facilities because we don't have uh, the stadium, but that leads to other issues as far as facility management, which I'll get into. But let's say it's uh, fall and, uh, you know, our gym sport is girls volleyball, right? But I have my basketball teams, as we're getting closer to basketball season, they're doing more and more off-season workouts. So we have to manage that. So what's volleyball schedule? And what, are they home? Are they away? Is it a practice day? When can basketball get in there? So we have to, we have to manage that. Uh, the other piece of that management is once uh, if we are the end of one season and they're in the playoffs and the other season has started. So if it's, again, if it's girls volleyball and, and the basketballs, um, you know, our girls volleyball team is usually in the playoffs. And if they have a home, uh, if they have a home playoff match, we have to coordinate with the basketballs as far as when they're going to be able to get in the gym. Okay. Um, our, another issue with our, our teams as far as the gym is um, sometimes um, sometimes the conference will schedule like a Saturday game. And uh, just the way our facility uh, operates, we don't usually have a custodial on a Saturday um, and then uh, security. So we try to steer our, um, it's usually basketball. We try to steer them away from Saturday games yeah. in our gym because it's going to, it's going to cost them extra money right. for security and, and custodial. So the other, um, the other part with our facilities, like I mentioned before, is this is with uh, field hockey when they get into the playoffs because we don't have a turf field. It's a grass field and field hockey has to be played once you get into CIF has to be played on turf. So, yeah. And it, it, it's a shame because uh, two years ago, we, um, we were the number two seed and uh, we had won, I think we had won CIF the year before and um, in division two. And so we moved up to division one and we were the number two seed and um we went to, we had to go play at Canyon Crest and they were the three seed. So not that it's a huge home field advantage, right? But we still had to travel down there. We had to leave earlier. Okay. Um, so 
um, not having that facility, but I always have to kind of coordinate as we're looking to the playoffs for field hockey, like, okay, if we're the higher seed, what are we going to do? Got so it. you just have to coordinate with the other AD and say, look, we don't have a facility. Um, and we may have to come play at your place. <laughs> if yeah, we don't yeah. find one. And then same thing with, with soccer, boys and girls soccer. I, I generally have to coordinate, um, our home matches to play at Vista Sports Park. Okay. Um, and like I said, that, that costs us money. So what we try to do is, if at all possible, can we get our varsity match at Vista and or RBV? So that takes a lot of, you know, it takes a lot of coordination on my part is looking at our schedule, pulling up their soccer schedules, right? Uh -huh. And a lot of times it's as we get into the playoffs, um, you know, are they in the playoffs? Do they have, um, you know, is their, uh, is their um, stadium being used for something else? You know, they have band. Um, they have, you know, RBV has lacrosse now in the spring. So it takes a lot of coordination um, to do that. All right. Well, I, th I think uh, the next thing will be is like, I think you kind of answered how, how your budget is set for your facilities, but in relationship, what is the relationship? Is that a separate office from the athletics? Like who, who drives more? Is it the facilities people or is the athletic department? Um, for the use of what? Of, of any facility on your campus. Oh yeah. That'll, um, it's kind of a, uh, there's kind of three areas. It's, it's me and the athletic department. It's my administration. Um, so my, um, one of my other APs, um, assistant principals is, uh, overseas facilities. Oh. And then my, uh, my head, uh, custodian, my yeah. plant lead. So we usually, especially, you know, the main facility that we have to, um, coordinate with is the gym mm -hmm. our outside fields are, um, not usually an issue. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that coordination with them, cause we have to look at the master calendar, um, you know, did, did our coach come in last minute looking for use of the gym? Mm -hmm. And then we already had something booked in there. Yeah. Um, we run it. We do run into an issue in the spring. Um, and the sport that uses the gym in the spring is boys volleyball. Yeah. And we'll almost always have an issue, um, you know, a few weeks during the spring year when we're doing uh, state testing mm -hmm. and we're doing AP testing. Okay. Um, because that's where we generally set up for, for those tests is in our gym. So. Got it. Now, w what role, if any, does Title IX play on your facilities and its usage? Um, well, yeah, we, we uh, definitely keep Title IX in mind. Um, we don't, again, you know, one of the big um, – one of the major areas where you see Title IX is use of the stadium. Mm -hmm. So like in the fall, field hockey and football, usually that's a Title IX issue. Mm -hmm. We don't have that because we don't have the stadium and we don't have football. Mm -hmm. So we, but we do, um, when you look at boys and girls basketball, boys and girls soccer, uh, when you look at softball and baseball, okay, boys and girls golf. So all those sports where you have that like, right? Mm -hmm. Um, boys and girls between the sports we um we do keep title nine in mind in the and the coaches i have conversations with them a lot of times it um i just had a conversation with our baseball coach because he has um he has some connections where they're looking to build uh dugouts for the baseball field um so i had that conversation with him the other day like look if you guys are getting materials and you're getting donations, whether it's material or, uh, or money, um, you know, you're going to have to, we're going to have to talk to softball about building dugouts. So it's either, it's either we talk to our softball coach and we get him on board where you guys are doing all of that together. Right. And then we're going to get them built on both fields, or you may have to raise enough, if he doesn't want to, to get that done for them. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Right? Because what happens is if, if um, let's say baseball is able to do that, and then, um, and then there's a, a Title IX issue, 
the district is kind of on the hook for that, okay. right? To to make it up and and take care of softball, and they're not gonna they're not gonna do that, right? So you have to have that understanding beforehand that um, that you get a plan for that. Okay. All right. So uh, right. can drive. you hear me? You froze up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's unsta- it's unstable. It's saying. <laughs> Yeah, my wife must be doing something. So, so here, here's the thing I, I'll ask um, about. So I, I was looking at other schools, and I think a couple of years ago, they seem to have, like, built the football fields for the schools. And, I, and I'm not sure, was that, like, district money, state money, but has anyone ever thought about, like, you know, Mr. Vista don't have a football team. So is there any plans to do the same thing for your field hockey field and make it so your field hockey field is equivalent to the surrounding schools? Yeah, I pushed. Um, so that when I became athletic during 2014, there was kind of two big um, little longer term projects that I was pushing for. One was we didn't have an athletic trainer. So, uh, we eventually, I eventually got the district to fund an athletic trainer at 50%. Okay. So we got that in, I believe 2016, maybe, maybe it was 15, 15, maybe it took me a year, year or two. So we do have a 50% athletic trainer now. Um, and now I'm pushing for that to be a hundred percent. Um, the other big issue was a field. So behind our behind our gym where we have kind of our varsity field. Um, I pushed for that and we do have plans um, that the district finally, um, the district finally said, okay, yeah, Mission Vista has athletics. They're doing pretty well, right? Um, We need to, um, we need to look at this. So we had a meeting with uh, me, my principal, admin, district uh, facilities, head of facilities, um, superintendent and the architect that works on the facilities like the, the stadium at Vista and RBV. So we do have plans. I think that was 2016 though, mm. and uh, it's still not built. Yeah. So uh, supposedly, well, I did see it, um, but the idea was it was going to be um, that money for that field would be in the bond oh, okay. um, that we had last year I think it was last year that passed Got it. problem is talking to our head of uh, facilities is he, basically his his uh, his story was that we will probably run out of money before that gets built so who knows what's going to happen mm-hmm. um, but yeah it is uh, the plans are the field would be turfed um, you know we'd have it fenced we'd have uh, smaller stands uh, since we don't have football. So it'd be like, um, um, if you've ever been to San Diego yes, or Canyon Crest where they just have stands on one side, uh, yeah. that's what we would have. But it'd be, it'd be smaller than that even. Uh, no, we wouldn't have a track around it because it doesn't fit down there. So it would actually be a really nice facility for field hockey and, and soccer. You know, right. kind of our own home little um, home advantage. Uh, um, yes. And, uh, we want to light it as well. That would have to go through like an environmental impact study because of the, um, the river is back there and there's some protected area. Oh, so, okay. But hopefully we can get that done. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah. That, that's a biggie. So yeah. it, it would take me to another part that I think you, y'all don't have, and I'm not even 100% sure, a swimming pool. No, we don't. So y'all don't y'all don't have an aquatics program. No, Vista and RBV don't either. We don't have one in the district. So they use uh, the wave. Okay. Over in Vista, yeah. I think that's a I think that's a problem generally in the North County Conference. I think Poway, maybe the Poway schools do, or okay. maybe not even all of them. Um, I know I don't think I don't think Tory and um, I don't think San Diego schools have them. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, it's a problem. All right. 
All right, so we're going to transportation here. So are your student athletes required to ride buses to sporting events? No, we don't have that provided by the district. Mm. And uh, um, it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an expense that a program has to pick up. So um, a couple of our teams will use a bus once in a while if they are traveling further or sometimes they'll want to do it just to uh, they'll look at it as kind of a team building opportunity, right. To have all the kids on the bus traveling to an away game or match, but no, we don't, it's not required because we don't have that from the district and it's such a, a big expense. Um, so we provide uh, our coaches, it's work. Our coaches have to, uh, um, you know, it's one of their things that they have to do is make sure that their kids can get to away competition so it takes uh you know that's something that we always have to do in our preseason meetings with our teams is we have to talk to our parents about that the ones who have been around obviously know but like new parents um and we have to usually figure out uh carpool situations okay and, and get those set up so and what what is your liability requirement as far as short insurance type? yeah they have paperwork that they uh there's two forms that um, that the kids have to have their parents sign. One is everybody has to sign. It's a it's basically a field trip form. Okay. And we just we do it so it covers all the dates of the season. Oh. Okay. Um, so it's kind of general, and that waives um, any liability, you know, for them traveling. Okay. And then there's another one if they're um, if for the parents who are going to be drivers. All right. They have to uh, they have to sign as well, and that has all their insurance information. So, right. yeah, so we do have we have those two forms to take care of liability. All right. Now, what is your policy on the biggest thing in athletics, especially with your seniors, with students driving themselves or other students to sporting events? Yeah, they're not allowed to drive other students. Okay. Um, they can drive themselves, but they again they have to have those two. Uh, they have to have those two forms filled out, but they don't drive other students. Right. If it's a car carpool situation, it has to be parent. A parent, got you. All right. So taking this coming coming to a wrap here, Mr. Hall, because I know you got to get to where you got to be. Um, your athletic clearance uh, issues. When you talk about athletic clearances, uh, what issues do you see at your school? What what is like the requirements. Like I see some schools, if I use uh, Sage Creek, I, I, no, not Sage Creek. It's the other school, uh, Del Lago. Okay. Kids can't have below Bs, right? Or else they can't play or register for a sport because they're a small school. So what is Mission Vista's athletic uh, requirements and, and clearance issues that you face at your school? Okay, so the, the academic piece is we follow, uh, we follow the CIF requirement in the Green Book, so 2.0. Okay. Uh, we, uh, coaches can individually make it more stringent if they want to. Um, generally, they don't. So a 2.0 a um, gets them cleared. Um, as far as other clearances, they have their um, athletic packet, which includes, um, you know, their physical. So they have to have the up-to-date physical. Um, that's good for a year, but they have to have a new one every academic year. Okay. Um, all the other stuff in that packet is residential requirements, right? So if they, uh, you know, if they transferred, um, we have to take care of that as well and all the paperwork with that, get that through CIF. Um, it's all of the signatures for concussion awareness, right? And, and risk, um, all those things that, that the parents waive. So that packet um, has to be turned in. Um, we don't have an online system. Some schools have an online system where all that's uh, submitted electronically. Yes. It makes it kind of easy. Mine is all, um, hard copy. So I get all those packets, <coughs> excuse me, I get all those cap packets um, 
I usually have a date set like three weeks before the season starts. And then I go through all those by hand, make sure everything's done. Yeah. Um, you do not have an athletic secretary. No, I do not. Wow. Okay. I okay. wish I did. But um, so, uh, and then my process with those is if the kids are like, if we're starting a season and it's tryouts, yeah. um, if the kid is cleared athlete, uh, physically, their physical is done, the doctor signed off, but they're missing something else in the packet, I'll let them start since they're medically cleared. And then I'll give those, we have a system in place, I'll give those packets back to the coach. And then the kid needs to get that taken care of by the next day so that I have a completed packet. And then if they don't, you know, then we'll, we'll suspend them from will stop them from participating until that's all done. Yeah. yeah until they all clear with that. Yeah. So when, when you talk about clearance and the big thing uh, with a lot of people you start and see, what is your process when you talk about athletic clearance, not just more or less the clearance, but letting homeschool students play at your school? Yeah. Our district policy is, uh, we don't have homeschool students uh, playing. Okay. So they have to attend. Uh, they have to attend um, one of the schools. All right. So they physically, they yeah. have to be physically be on your campus. Yes. Yeah. And we don't have. Uh, and I know CIF allows that, and CIF also does allow students um, at one school in the district to play sport at another school in the district if that's the school they go to doesn't have it but our district doesn't allow that either so if you want to play say football you have to go to vista or rbv you can't go to mission vista and then play football at vista or rbv oh i didn't know that yeah i get that i get that call several times a year about different sports like hey rbv started lacrosse i'm a student at mission vista can i still attend Mission Vista and play lacrosse at RBV and the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Cause I was good. That was going to be my next question. Yeah. Kids playing, being at your school and playing at another school yeah. sport. And so y'all don't allow it. And that's a yeah. district call. Yeah. District can, the district can be stricter with that. Okay. Than the CIF bylaw. CIF, CIF does allow it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, all right. So we we got about one one more question here. Okay, okay, and and it's a a big one because it's a, a major thing. Like I said, uh, the school is a Christian school. What is your position on religion within athletics? Hmm. Religion in athletics in a public school. Um, I mean, my advice to uh, coaches would be, I would like myself as the coach of, of girls soccer is I would keep that out of my program mm -hmm. coming from me. Yeah. Oh. Um, and that's just because I would, I would just err on the side of caution with it. Right. I don't know. Um, every kid in my program, I don't know what religion they practice, if any, and their parents' views on it, right? So I would, I would keep that, for me, I would keep it neutral. And that would be my advice to a coach. Um, I mean, and then if you're going to use it at all, like let's say it's a pregame prayer or whatever, I would advise them to keep that as neutral as possible as well, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, that's, uh, I mean, that would be my advice in a public school. Okay. So, so the, the Bishop of this college, he had, he asked, you know, all of us as coaches, um, do you feel like we have lost our way when you talk about sports, morals, and ethics? as compared to yesteryear, probably when you were a younger athlete and today, have sports lost their way? And this is gonna be my final question for you. Are we off the track? 
uh, are kids missing the point? Um, I don't think, I think it depends where they are. Like, I don't think you have to have, um, and I'm Catholic. I don't think you have to have uh, the uh, religious aspect of it for kids to have that. I think it takes, uh, first of all, within a program, the coach, and then overall the athletic program to, um, to set the foundation and to teach those things that the kids should be exhibiting and learning from their, from their teams, right? So sportsmanship right? Competing honestly, right? All those, all those things that most of us want our kids to do and to have, I don't think it takes, um, I don't think it takes religion to do that. <clears throat> I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, many of us probably from our upbringing and, and our religion were taught those things. Um, I don't think we're just taught them from religion. So I think, um, I think if you're in the right place, I think our kids are learning that stuff. And I don't, I don't think overall, if you look at it as a North County conference, or if you look at it as a San Diego section, or even bigger state national, I don't think overall that we're, we're off the rails. Um, I think there's, maybe there's more instances of it, or maybe there's more instances of it that we see nationally because of social media, right? Uh, and quicker contact, quicker dissemination of information. But, um, you know, from what I generally see is overall the kids are, um, <clears throat> kids are still learning, right? The same things, hard work, teamwork, right? And the, and the coaches on the round are, are taking care of that. Okay. All right. And so last and not least, here it is. What is Mission Vista's core values? So, being in the Marine Corps, uh, we, we have a set of core values and it, it's honor, courage, commitment. Mm -hmm. What is Mission Vista's core values? Yeah, our, our core values, um, when we talk about all of our, uh, uh, all of our athletics is uh, inclusion, uh, competitiveness, right? And then excellence, both in the classroom and, you know, with their team whether it's on the court or on the field. So those, those are kind of our, our, our big ones. Okay. All right. Hey, I, I really appreciate it, Mr. Hall, you taking this time to give me an hour out of your day. It, it really helps me a lot. Uh, you know, ho hopefully one day the goal is, is this program is designed to, uh, I'm going on the athletic uh, director side. So I'm trying to shoot for hopefully one day, you know, I don't know uh, when I retire from the government, cause I'm a walk on coach at Fallbrook for yeah. volleyball. One day I'm gonna try to get into collegiate volleyball coaching. That's the design. Uh, and you know, who knows one day I might be barking up at Patrick's door, try to take his job. That's who, right. <laughs> who knows, you know, I'll be living here in Fallbrook or I could be down at Mission Vista. Who, who it knows? Could be. It could be. It goes. But that that is the end state here is to try to get on that athletic director path. And uh and this was all designed to for us to see what it is the athletic directors a little bit of tapping into your mind and your resources and saying uh I, I really appreciate this so much. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, of course. Good luck with everything. Let me uh let me know if you need anything else. Yes, sir. Hey, 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 thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful day. I think you said you got a class here at nine fifteen. AP U.S. History, baby. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Oh, you. Oh, that's right. Y'all on online. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, look. One. One last thing before you do go. What do you. What do you feel about this current environment of teaching online? You know, my son. He. He's here at the house and. He's a 10th grade at Fallbrook. What do you think about this environment of teaching online? Is it good, bad, or indifferent? Uh, I, you know, I think it's, uh, it's almost like a case by case basis and, and where you are and, and, you know, what type of kids and families are you working with? You know, I think there's a big difference obviously between say like elementary school and high school, mm -hmm. right? Like I, I wouldn't, 
I don't know if I would be able to teach elementary school online, <laughs> right? And then I think it's what kids are you working with? Like even just at Mission Vista, I have, um, I teach two classes, not three because of, um, because I'm athletic director okay. uh, and both of my classes are AP U.S. history. So it's AP kids and their juniors. All right. So they're pretty responsible um, um, and motivated. All right. So it would, it's different if I was teaching probably a regular class. All right. right? So I'd have, I'd have more issues with engagement. Yeah. Um, and then I think it depends where you are um, as far as socioeconomics. Gotcha. You know, if you're in a, a wealthier area and the kids are going to have, you know, internet connection and devices and, you know, maybe one of their parents or both are home also and there's more supervision, right? Versus, um, versus an area where most of the kids, they might be home alone because their parents, even in the midst of the pandemic, their parents have to go work and maybe they have trouble with a device or they, their internet connection isn't good, even if they have it, you know? So I think all those things play a part. Got you. Well, that, that's good. I, that's, I was wondering that. That's yeah. good, good to go. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm going to tell you what.